arrived at Grant Park. The music has swelled, the people are on their feet, and there's just an indescribable feeling of excitement. Perhaps it's been the media coverage and perhaps it's the size of the crowd, but certainly everything in the pontiff's trip to Chicago has been building up to this point. It is not the last function in his busy schedule, but it is, uh, at least as an event, the most important to the people of Chicago. Obviously, his address before the bishops at Quigley Seminary this morning will be more significant in the history of this event. There's a considerable amount of um, activity now as the pool media, those cameramen and reporters who accompany the Pope everywhere on his visit to Chicago, get in place. And the pontiff now will, will disembark and uh, very shortly make his appearance, his first appearance, to this crowd in front of the altar. He has been seen by those in the area of Buckingham Fountain and, and south of the Banshell, those who will not be able to see him necessarily because of the uh, construction of the altar, and he will be addressing those to the north. But we wait. The music has stopped, and everything will apparently stop until uh, the Holy Father makes his appearance. Joel, the Holy Father is now in the Petrillo band shell being vested, and uh, Father Roll, perhaps you can tell us what's happening in the vesting of the Holy Father. Well, I'm sure he might be wiping his brow a little bit after <laughs> going around and he waving to the crowd like that, but they will be investing him in the traditional mass vestments, would be, which would be the long white uh, garment of the alb, which is underneath, and just the... This is a ceremony in itself. A, sort of, yeah. The, the prayers for the vesting were dropped back in 1965, but they would still be optional. The miter will be placed on his head at the end, but the pallium is what we were talking about before, this sort of collar-like garment that's a collar-like article that's worn with two straps in the front and the back. It's a circular band of wool that's embroidered with black crosses it's worn over the shoulders with short straps hanging over. Only the Pope wears it at this Mass. Each bishop is given one, or each cardinal is given one, when they are uh, made cardinals. And the outer garment that will be worn, that will be left here in Chicago, is a garment that's worn by every priest when they celebrate Mass. It has its origin from a uh, type of coat that was worn in the fourth century when Mass was celebrated in the catacombs, where it was very cold indeed. And so it was first used as a dress by ordinary people, but now it's become stylized and recognized vestment of the Mass within the church. Finally, he'll have the staff, and as we mentioned this morning, only the Pope is allowed to carry the staff or the crozier that has a crucifix on it. Every other bishop carries a shepherd's type of staff, but the Pope carries one that is a, uh, has a crucifix, but it's still a sign of his pastoral office as a shepherd, where the word pastor comes from. Father, as the uh, bishops uh, took their positions, we noticed some different headdresses. The uh, Byzantine order, uh, the Byzantine rite, which Byzantine is a rite within rite. the Roman Catholic Church, which is in the rite within the Catholic Church, and still uh, does claim obedience to the Holy Father. Beautiful headpieces that they wear. What is the? What do they officially call that? That, that would be called a mitre or possibly a crown. I'm not certain of the terminology, but it's uh, different because it comes from the East, from the Byzantine Empire. Beginning. cross led with the incense behind it. There is a book of the Gospels, the two people who will be carrying the book. And the music begins with the opening hymn of the Mass, Lord Jesus, come. And let us listen to that now.
At this point, Father, we should probably take a minute to explain what happens next. Well, there will be the traditional sign of the cross to open the Mass as we begin all our liturgical services in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then there will be a presentation by Cardinal Cody of the catechumens. The word catechumen is an ancient church term that identifies those who are earnestly seeking to learn more about Christ, his gospels, and the traditions of the church. And at one time, the first part of the Mass was called the Mass of the Catechumens because after the sermon, after the homily, the catechumens were sent out of the church. You hear the people starting to chant? Long live the Pope. They've been chanting that all along the way for the last day and a half. But this emphasis on the catechumens, who we'll see in a few minutes, re um, shows that these inquirers are bound together as a unit, that they're guided and supported in their quest for faith by sponsors, and their sponsors will also be present with them. He'll receive a blessing from the Holy Father, and we hope that he's going to do it with this crozier, that he'll pick up the crozier in his hands and bless them, which should be a very dramatic picture. And the sponsors will trace the sign of the cross on their foreheads. He's making his way now to the chair, and he, of course, as I mentioned before, wants it to be called a chair, not a throne, because... Now, every time he walks toward the end of the platform to wave to the crowd, that is always spontaneous that is not planned. this is all spontaneous and I imagine he's driving poor Monsignor no way who tries to keep <laughs> everything going a little bit out of his mind at this point he did the same thing last night at st. Peter's yeah. got out of the limousine and started walking toward the crowd at which point the Secret Service men mm -hmm. were very nervous it's amazing so many f familiar faces are on that platform and they're just totally awed I've never seen some of these men so quiet in my life <laughs> He's making his way now to the chair, finally. The catechumens will be presented to him by in Cardinal his chair. Cody. Right.
since the altar represents Christ and that Christ, we believe, is the cornerstone of the church, the Pope just kissed the altar as a sign of reverence as any priest does. And now he will incense the altar. This shows the solemnity of the Mass because a very special thing, since we believe that the altar is actually the body of Christ and also the table around which the community gathers, uh, it's shown a very special respect by the incense. Father, these are all traditional components of the Mass, aren't they? Extremely traditional. This is a... Incense was used at one time just because of the fact, again, in the catacombs, there was such a smell and the dampness, and incense was used to make it a pleasant smelling place. And now he is... Uh, now this is not expected either. Look at the grin. He's going down <laughs> to incense the people, which is not usually done at this point of the Mass. He is certainly running this show, isn't he? he There's no is. doubt about it. Oh, he's incensing the cross. I take that back. This is all in preparation for the actual ceremony. Exactly. Then he will return to the chair. As he goes around the altar, if you notice the table-like structure that it is, the bread and wine which will be brought up to the altar are the symbols of eating and drinking, of course. So the Mass has always been seen as a meal. Christ celebrated that first Mass as a Passover supper, really, with his apostles on that Holy Thursday. That's the postcard I'd like to have, Father. Isn't that beautiful? It's just magnificent. Now he will bow once again and return to his chair. The chair is really a symbol of his office, and the word cathedral comes from cathedra, chair. That's where the bishop's chair is, or the pope's chair is. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. The church in Chicago gladly presents to you those who have heard the gospel and believe in the good news. They come before us today to express their desire to prepare for initiation into the church through baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. What do you ask? of God's church. Is, uh... At this point, the catechumens are coming into position with their sponsors behind them. The Holy Father questioned them about what do they ask of the church, and they answered to share in the life and the faith of the church. And now as they gather there, the Holy Father will greet them and really just give them a sign of encouragement, followed by a blessing. As they come down the steps, they will then be presented with books of the gospel that they will keep as a very, very special souvenir of this occasion.
What do you ask of God's church? If you earnestly desire to share in the faith of the church and be disciples of Jesus, you must be introduced to the fullness of truth which he has revealed to us. You must learn to make the mind of Jesus Christ your own. You must strive to pattern your life on the teachings of his gospel, loving the Lord your God and your neighbor as Christ has commanded. Do you agree to all these things, <coughs> sponsors, are you ready to help these men and women come to know and follow Christ? Father of mercy, we thank you for your servants. You have sought and summoned them in many ways, and they have turned to seek you. You have called them today, and they have answered in your presence. We praise you, Lord, and give you thanks. Receive the sign of the cross. Christ himself is now your strength. Through this sign of his love, learn to know him and follow him. Almighty God, by the cross and resurrection of your Son, you have given life to your people. Your servants have received the sign of the cross. Make them living proof of its saving power and help them to persevere in the footsteps of Christ. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. We welcome you as catechumens and invite you now to share with us at the table of God's Word. singing the ancient hymn of praise in which the church prays to the Father, called the Gloria. It is used on all Sundays outside of Advent and Lent on solemnities, feasts, and solemn local celebrations such as this. This is also a composition of Dr. Alexander Pelequin from the Mass he composed called the Mass of the Bells. It has a bell quality as it goes back and forth as we listen.
Let us pray. God, our Father, you will all to be saved and come to the knowledge of your truth. Send workers into your great harvest that the gospel may be preached to every creature and your people gather together by the word of life and strengthen by the power of the sacraments may advance in the way of salvation and love. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We'll now come to the Liturgy of the Word where the three scripture texts will be written, written, read, excuse me. There will be a reading from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, the Epistles, and then finally the Gospel. The first reading is from the Bible, and it's a book taken from the book of the prophet Zechariah. It is a bold invitation to all peoples to seek the Lord. And the purpose of the choice of this selection is that it captures the ethnic diversity and religious pluralism of, Ameri of the American faith experience. And it's being read by Mr. Clem, Clem Azaron of Hoffman Estates. A reading from the book of the prophet Zechariah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, there shall yet come peoples, the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall approach those of another and say to them, Come, let us go to implore the favor of the Lord, and I too will go to seek the Lord. Many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to implore the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days, ten men of every nationality, speaking different tongues, shall take hold, yes, Take hold of every Jew by the edge of his garment and say to him, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. This is the word of the Lord. What will follow now is the responsorial psalm, a prayer or song of response to the word which has just been proclaimed. It usually has a meditative quality to it. The selection for today will be Psalm 98, which again will be sung by the choir and back and forth with the uh, congregation.
quickly we should mention that the woman who was leading the psalm, the cantor, was Joan Sachs. She's a soloist with the Waukegan Symphony Chorus. The second reading will be taken from the letter of St. Paul to the community at Corinth, which is a town in Greece. This reading is a very evangelistic exhortation keeping in the theme of the Mass that Pope John Paul has picked. And there is even talk that he picked the readings himself. This reading will be done by Sister Teresita Wint, who is at the community of St. Catherine and St. Lucy in Oak Park. Sister Teresita will read the reading in Spanish, proclaim the reading actually in Spanish, and she is a school sister of Notre Dame. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The love of Christ impels us who have reached the conviction that since one died for all, all died. He died for all so that those who live may no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sakes died and was raised up. Because of this, we no longer look on anyone by mere human judgment. If at one time we so regarded Christ, we no longer know him by this standard. This means that anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old order has passed away. Now all is new. All this has been done by God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. I mean God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself not counting our transgressions against us, and that he has entrusted the message of reconciliation to us. This makes us ambassadors for Christ, God, as it were, appealing to us. We implore you, in Christ's name, be reconciled to God. This is the word of the Lord. What will follow next is the procession of the Gospels. Before the Gospel, there's always a special song or chant. It's an acclamation, a recognition of the presence of Christ in the very proclamation of the Gospel. The people will sing Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. It's often accompanied by a second element, a scripture verse, which is put in between the verses of the Alleluia. Often these verses will come from the gospel that has been chosen. Before the gospel procession begins, the Pope will put incense into the thurible or the container which holds the incense as it's burned. The incense is used as a mark of honor or respect. It's also a symbol of man's spirit rising up as the smoke rises up to God through prayer and sacrifice. The candles, the candles will also accompany the gospel book that is being brought forth by the deacon. It's a very special gospel book. This book contains only the gospels. It's a bound book that has, um, was presented to Cardinal Mundelein in 1938 when he acted as the Pope's representative at a Eucharistic Congress held in New Orleans. In this procession, the Word of God is carried, surrounded by candles and incense. All of this converges toward the moment when God speaks to his people in his Word. Respect, reverence, and joy. The people stand to hear the word of God proclaimed to them. You see the bishops standing in the moment. The Pope will stand, removing his cap. Standing is also an expression of our awareness that we've been redeemed in Jesus. Teach all people my gospel. I am. 
Believe in him might have eternal. 